All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, ILM 310-302J in measurement, magnetic flow meters. There's pictures of some magnetic flow meters for you there. Um, sounds like most of you guys are oil and gas people out there, so you might not see a whole bunch of magnetic flow meters out there due to the fact that they don't generally work on things that aren't conductive and oil kind of falls into that category. Um, but huge devices in water and wastewater and anything that has to do with water, uh, you're likely going to find magnetic flow meters. Um, so let's have a look and see what we can what we can learn about magnetic flow meters today. So objectives today, uh, describe the principles and applications of magnetic flow meters, components of magnetic flow meters, installation requirements of magnetic flow meters, uh, maintenance calibration of magnetic flow meters, and advantages and limitations. So standard set of objectives uh, that we're going to see um, basically for all the devices that we're looking at uh, moving forward here. Um, of particular interest today, uh, probably objective number three when it comes to mag meters. Uh, they're a little bit more particular in terms of uh, awareness of installation principles. Um, so those highlight a few important things in that section here. Uh, and then the rest of this stuff here is uh, not very painful at all. So let's get started and look at magnetic flow meters and uh, the dapper dude who is responsible for the uh, harnessing the science of magnetic flow meters, our wonderful friend, Michael Faraday. Dapper young man there. And mag meters use the principle of Faraday's law for operation. And those of you who are electricians may remember something similar to this in your past. Faraday's law states that if a conductor of length is moving with a velocity perpendicular to a magnetic field of flux density, a voltage will be produced. So this is really the uh, premise behind a whole bunch of electrical uh, devices and uh, motors and generators and things like that. So we owe quite a bit to Mr. Faraday uh, for his contributions to uh, our trade. In a mag meter, we use the fluid as the conductor. And within the mag meter itself, we have magnetic coils, which are excited to create these lines of flux that the conductor or the fluid flows through and the relationship between that flow and those lines of flux is used to determine our flow. So here's some proof if you don't believe me, and you feel free to work this out on your own, but there's a few variables in here as you can see. The electric uh, energy that's created within a magnetic flow meter is a result of the contributions of these variables here we'll see e is the emf generated b is the magnetic field strength which is a known value based on the coils within the mag meter d is the distance between the electrodes based on the size of the tube um what the heck the proportionality constant is c and it doesn't change and don't panic there is not uh, any super crazy math in this section here either uh, b is the average velocity uh, long story short, we start out with this rather uh, long and drawn out uh, equation that tells us, tells us where we're getting our EMF from. Um, but what really happens is that C, B, and D will combine uh, basically into what we will call a K factor. And we end up with a minimal uh, formula derived from our base formula there, which basically tells us that we can find our E using uh, the meter factor and the millivolts per meter per second and the velocity per meter per second. Or we can extrapolate that formula to find the velocity uh, using the EMF and our uh, meter factor. Again, it simplifies yet once more where we can calculate the uh, flow by knowing the cross-sectional area of the pipe and the average velocity of the medium that's flowing through that pipe. And this is kind of uh, we don't get too much more in, oops, sorry, in depth uh, in terms of formulas as this one here uh, with a slight caveat that we're going to see on the next page here. And this kind of represents uh, the depth of the math that we're looking at in terms of magnetors. Oh boy, getting real crazy here. 
All right, so here we have a magmeter which measures flow output of three millivolts per meter per second. The flow tube sends 15 millivolts to the transmitter. What is the velocity? So again, taking the formula from the previous slide, velocity equals the EMF divided by uh, the K factor. And in this case, it's three millivolts for every meter per second. And we have a flow tube which is sending 15 millivolts. So we divide 15 divided by three and we can then drive our velocity, which is five meters per second. So nothing too crazy there. Gets a little bit more hairy here when we, uh, sorry, add in the calculation, uh, the calculation for the cross-sectional area uh, of the piping. Um, and that's represented by this magical formula you may remember from middle school or high school where we used area is pi d squared divided by four. So we're gonna introduce that. And this is as, as complicated as it gets. So again, the magmeter's uh, K factor is three millivolts per meter per second. Calculate the flow rate in meters cubed per hour if the inside diameter of our pipe is 2.067 inches. So using uh, our magical formula uh, over here, we can find our uh, diameter in inches and all that kind of wonderful stuff. And we multiply that by pi times our diameter squared, divided by four, tells us that the area of that pipe is 0 0.002 meters squared. And then we multiply 0 0.002 meters times five meters per second we get 0 0.018 meters cubed per second, and we have to convert that into hours, meters cubed per hour, so 3,600 seconds in every hour, and that'll get us a total flow in meters cubed per hour of 38.97. So that's the depth of the math that we're looking at in this section here. Moving on to characteristics of magmeters, talking a little bit about the devices themselves. So pop all these up here at once. Okay, some things that we have to know about magmeters. The flow tube must be non-magnetic so that the lines of flux will pass through the fluid and not around the fluid in the tube or using the tube as a, a conductor for those lines of magnetic flux. Thus, it has to be non-magnetic. The fluid going through a magmeter must be conductive or have a minimum conductivity. Uh, in this case, five micro siemens per centimeter is the number I believe the ILM lays out for us. This excludes uh, almost all oil products because oils uh, are generally not conductive. Um, so keep that in mind. And there's a table in the ILM that shows the uh, conductivity of certain fluids. I'd, may or may not have been included in this presentation. Changing the fluid conductivity has little effect due to the high impedance of the detection circuitry. I'm not getting into this in great big depth here, but what high impedance does basically is allows you to collect a very, very weak signal or a very small signal. Uh, and then use electronics to amplify that signal. So it's a way of getting uh, a large drop of voltage or current uh, within the device that it can then amplify into a measurement. So uh, this is why changing conductivity doesn't affect it too much. Flow tubes are usually made out of 304 stainless steel with the Teflon lining. Um, the reason to do that is to keep the conductive fluid, fluids from shorting out uh, against the tube. So there is isolation between the, uh, the metal part of the tube and the actual inside of the tube. You'll see that there is a, a liner. Maybe I can zoom back here real quick. So you see uh, here's the tube, uh, usually made out of stainless steel. Uh, and then within that tube, you'll see there's a, there's a liner in here. Okay, uh, the generated voltage of a magmeter is linearly proportional to the velocity of the fluid. So this is something moving forward that you're going to see in the majority of the flow measurements that we look at going forward is that they are linear uh, as opposed to differential pressure, um, which is a square root relationship uh, between uh, the velocity of the fluid and the value that we uh, end up measuring. Okay, the only time conductivity is a problem if there is none. 
Okay, so this includes fluids like oil, uh, demineralized water, and ultra pure water. Those are the problem childs, uh, I guess, in terms of magmeters and applications that have these fluids. Probably not the best choice uh, would be a magmeter. Most water based fluids are great for a magmeter as long as they are conductive. And again, um, that is most water stuff except for uh, demon water and ultra pure water, which we'd usually be, uh, only see in uh, steam type applications. So the next little bit talks about technologies uh, involved in magmeters. And as we go through these, keep in mind that they are kind of evolutionary, uh, meaning out meaning that we're going to start out with kind of the most basic type of magmeter technology. Um, we'll define how it works. Uh, we'll define uh, its weaknesses. And then generally what you're going to see moving forward is that the second type of technology uh, incorporates something that fixes the shortcomings of the previous technology. So pay attention as we move forward for things like that. So there are about five different, oh yeah, nice. There are about five different types of technologies that we talk about uh, with magmeters when we're talking about the magnetic field excitation methods. Uh, and this is the type of um, electricity that we're, we're providing to the coils to create those lines of flux that the fluid is passing through. So we'll start out with AC type followed by straight DC. This has some things in it that fix the shortcomings of this. Then we go to pulse DC type or pulse DC tri-state it's often called, uh, which will have some benefits that fix some of the shortcomings of this one and so on and so forth as we go forward. So let's have a look at the characteristics of these types of excitation. First type here is AC type, typically at the 60 Hertz frequency. The output of the magmeter will also be an AC signal that is proportional to the velocity of the fluid. So as the flow increases, the magnitude of the oscillations of the output signal will also increase. Notice that we have uh, the output signal in phase with the field excitation. Because the converter rectifies this voltage and sends, uh, sends as an instrumental, uh, all the noise that is contained within this arrangement here is also included in part of this signal. This is the main problem with AC type excitation in phase noise. Uh, and because of this, the meter must be re zeroed frequent, uh, frequently. When we talked about uh, the effect of noise in earlier uh, lectures, I think it was analyzers, where we said that there's a there's a threshold value that we need to have to be sure that the signal that we're getting is a measurement signal and not a noise signal. So that same kind of issue is also inherent to these AC type magnetometers, uh, and as a result, um, in order to maintain a consistent measurement signal we have to re-zero the magmeter frequently to eliminate the offset that's created by uh, external interference. About 15% of all the magmeters out there are AC type. The rest of them are DC type. These are best used uh, for air in a process stream uh, in applications where the particles are not uniform and where we have flow pulsations under 15 Hertz. And I can't give you an exact example of where you get flow pulsations under 15 Hertz, but I'm sure it must happen somewhere. Moving to the second type of excitation, we have pulsed DC type excitation. Uh, the frequency range for this technology is in the neighborhood of three to 30 Hertz. I think the ILM has honed in on this a little bit. Uh, and, and throwing a number in there like eight hertz or something like that. But at any point, at any, at any point here, uh, it is somewhere between three and 30 hertz usually. So basically what we get going on here with a pulse DC type excitation, and as DC happens to be, it's either a positive uh, a voltage or a negative voltage. But in this case, pulse DC type provides a positive DC pulse at certain timed intervals which creates an output signal from the flow tube, which corresponds to those uh, pulsed 
uh, coil signals, and that allows us to um, capture a measurement that is relative to the overall signal, the magnetic field signal plus the, uh, the, the external noise signal, and it also allows us to isolate the noise when we have no pulse. So when we have a pulse, we get the measurement signal and the noise. When we don't have a pulse, we get just the noise. So by isolating these two things, we can then subtract the noise from the actual uh, total signal in order to get our uh, flow signal out of it. So this is how they overcome that problem uh, that we saw with the AC type excitation. As a result, we get improved accuracy uh, and improved zero stability. This good is very. Uh, this method is good at eliminating noise, but what happens with DC excitation uh, when we have the voltage only going in one direction, a positive pulse, a positive pulse, a positive pulse, we get something called polarization, which means um, which means that it has a tendency to attract uh, it has a tendency to attract things to the electrodes, and they stay there because there is no reversing pulse that wants to push these ions away from the electrode. So what happens is that the electrodes end up becoming uh, what we call polarized. Um, and the consequence of that is that they collect things that are attracted to the electrodes, these ions that are collect, uh, attracted to the electrodes, and they become covered with crud. Uh, and that's the scientific term. Uh, and, as a res and that's one of the big problems, uh, the main problem when we're talking about pulse, pulse DC. Uh, excitation, and these are uh, a little a little bit slower. Again, we're looking at a, a pulse, a pause, a pulse, a pause, a pulse, a pause, uh, versus a positive uh, sine wave and then a negative sine wave and then a positive sine wave, which is um, essentially twice as fast. So now we look at number three, uh, which is pulsed DC tri-state. The tri-state portion of this pulse DC. Uh, is what's different here. The pulse is the same as we had before, um, where we get a, 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 a pulse voltage uh, in some direction. Uh, in this case, we're looking at tri-state. So this tells us that we're going to have one positive pulse, no voltage, a negative pulse, no voltage, positive pulse. So this does a few things for us. It, again, eliminates the noise that we get from AC excitation um, by providing a negative voltage pulse, it encourages uh, all that crud to no longer be attracted to the electrodes, um, so we don't get that polarization. So eliminating the noise problems, uh, eliminating the electromagnetic polarization of the electrodes, uh, these are the achievements that we get with this pulse DC tri-state style uh, of excitation. Moving into the next ones here, they've kind of added these in the last couple of years, so I'm assuming this has to do with advancements in technology. Um, this one is called high signal pulsed DC tri-state. So the main, it's essentially the same as the pulse DC tri-state we looked at in the previous slide, uh, except we have a higher current, uh, which creates a stronger magnetic field. We also have uh, higher frequency, which is better, better for noisy flows like pulps, uh, metals, and slurries. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about noisy flows because I know where you may be thinking what exactly is a noisy flow, um, but we'll talk about that in a different lecture uh, in this flow section. Um, so here, oh, wait a second. That was it. That's all I'm saying about that. Um, and the last one here is dual frequency excitation off of page 11 here. Um, so again, without getting into the dirty, dirty details of uh, the operation of every single one of these ones here, um, these will use a high frequency and a low frequency pulse. Uh, and the overall effect of this technology combines the benefit of AC and DC style. So we get the speed because we're constantly measuring. There's no lag time. We get the pulses, which help us uh, eliminate the noise. And we get the reversing uh, of polarity, which eliminates um, that uh, electromagnetic polarization effect that, um, that is inherent with um, the
the pulse DC type magnetor. So if we uh, look at some of these in comparison here off page 11, uh, high frequency excitation, 75 hertz, noise immunity is high, stability is low, accuracy is low. Um, moving in now to a pulse sort of DC arrangement here, we have a much lower frequency as we uh, as we indicated earlier, we have low noise immunity, high stability, and high accuracy. And then lo and behold, we take uh, item A, add it to item B, and we get something that looks something like uh, C here is a dual frequency excitation kind of model where you get uh, the dual frequency pulses. And lo and behold, provides you the best of both worlds here, getting you high noise immunity, high stability, and also high accuracy. So lots of uh, wonderful science behind magnetors. Particular different here, uh, something that's a little bit unique in magnetors and not something uh, I've seen very commonly, um, but there is a totally twisted different kind of layout for a magnetor and it's called the capacitance style magnetor. Uh, and the main thing here that sets this capacitance meter apart is the location of these electrodes in a common mag meter we have uh, the electrodes that are protruding into the pipe with little buttons that are inside the uh, inside the liner inside the process stream and these are contacting or as they like to call it here wetted with the capacitance style meter the electrodes are mounted on the outside uh, of the pipe and of course there's going to be special applications uh, associated with the capacitance type meter so they have non-contacting electrodes uh, these are also high frequency, so they reduce the effect of electrical noise. They are good for very low conductivities, 0.1 microsiemens, where we said typically we like them to be about five. So that works really good. And the main benefit uh, from having those electrodes on the outside uh, means that they're better suited for coating applications because obviously it's pretty hard to coat something that you're not even touching. So that is capacitance style. Uh, meters there. So that kind of highlights the different types of uh, technology in terms of signal generations for magnetors. Uh, the next section here, uh, objective of what deals with applications. So magnetors, as we said earlier, only work on conductive fluids. Most hydrocarbons, oil and gas products, are non-conductive, so they won't work in that application. Uh, if you work in oil and gas, you might not see a lot of magnetors, uh, maybe on something where you're removing water from a separator or something, possibly you might get a magnetor, um, but in general, not very common in oil and gas industry. Uh, they are good for dirty corrosive or, brace or abrasive fluids based on liner material. So there are lots of different liner materials, and we'll talk about that later on. Uh, again, most commonly a magnetor is a, a 304 stainless steel body with a Teflon liner, um, but there are uh, different configurations uh, depending on your process uh, application. What are some applications? So some applications include water and wastewater, and huge, huge in water and wastewater. Uh, I worked at the wastewater plant in Red Deer here for about uh, three years uh, before I started working at the college. And if the flow meter wasn't an ultrasonic uh, meter on an open channel using a weir, it was, it was going to be a mag meter, whether it was uh, clean water going out or dirty water uh, coming in, mag meters were huge. Uh, clean water plant, same thing, um, huge in the water industry or any industry that uh, the main medium is water-based. So pulp and paper falls in there. Uh, cellulose, which is sort of related to pulp and paper. Uh, pharmacies, food and beverage, cosmetics, fertilizers, uh, lots of applications that we can use a magnetor in, mining, chemical processing, liquid feed batching, all kinds of wonderful things. Again, conductivity is the uh, hinge pin there. Uh, they have to be a uh, minimum level of conductivity for sure, and that usually means that we're dealing with some kind of a, uh, a medium that's carried by water. Magmeters are available in sizes from two and a half millimeters to three meters. So wrap your head around that for a second. 
okay, what are some of the drawbacks uh, of magnetometers? They cannot be used on gas flows. They, like many of the other instruments we talked about, should be mounted in vertical runs. Again, the idea here is ensuring that the pipe is full. Uh, an, an unfull pipe will give you an inaccurate measurement, and one way to guarantee a full pipe is to mount the meter vertically because you can't have a half full pipe pumping straight up in the air. Uh, the excitation from the coils may cause overheating if the tube is empty. So again, you're creating uh, you're creating heat with the coils that create the lines of flux, uh, and we rely on the process medium to, to cool them. Uh, if you have no flow or an empty pipe, that's problematic. Some of the mag meters um, have different cleaning options for these coated uh, electrodes that we talked about earlier. Some of them, if they didn't get coated, uh, I wasn't fortunate enough really to uh, experience that at the wastewater treatment for plant for example uh, when you had electrode issues you would have to pull the meter and actually clean the crud off of them and let me tell you in the wastewater treatment world the crud is really cruddy um, so to that extent here uh, some of these mag meters have built-in heaters in the electrodes that can burn off the deposits and there's a couple of different ones i'm surprised i haven't listed them all here right now but uh, we'll talk about a couple other methods uh, for cleaning the electrodes uh, coming up here uh, conductive coatings or, or the crud that we're talking about on the inside of the tube could cause shorting so that's problematic uh, probably the most important thing with the mag meter is proper grounding the, the output of the mag meter uh, electrodes is millivolts, like a couple hundred millivolts. Uh, I don't know, uh, well, I guess I do know. You haven't been in a lab yet to do uh, your lab experiment with grounding and shielding, um, but when you do, you will discover that if you hold the leads of a multimeter up just in the air, positive in one hand and a negative in the other hand, and you set it to, to voltage, you can pick up hundreds of millivolts just loading in the air. So again, that gets added to our measurement signal, uh, and we identify that as a problem with some of these mag meters that the technology is taking uh, care of. But the best thing that we can do about that is to make sure that we have proper grounding to reduce that noise. And we'll talk more specifically about that uh, moving forward here. Accuracy of a mag meter. I believe the ILM says it's around uh, a half of a percent is what they say. Um, generally, the, the range is about half a percent to about 2% um, for accuracy rating here. So the next few slides here are just uh, something for interest sakes, and I won't spend a whole bunch of time on them here. So construction of a mag meter. So there's a mag meter uh, body. Looking at the size of that bad boy. This could be a man meter, I'm not sure. There's some excitation on the outside there, so this would be like a capacitive type mag meter. And it's a bad boy. So I don't know what it is now, but back in the day, uh, a basic mag meter was 5,000 bucks for like a four or six inch mag meter and add an inch, add a grand kind of thing. So that mag meter that we looked at here, that uh, start out at 5,000 bucks down here and then add another 90 inches. So this is probably, you know, a hundred thousand dollar meter, something like that but very, very large. Uh, and this is why they use them in water and wastewater. You'll see these on dams uh, and things like that. Okay, so some notes, overall notes here dealing with uh, magmeters here again. Fluid must be conductive. Uh, the rangeability generally for magmeters, and this will vary between manufacturers, but generally about 10 to one. Uh, no pressure loss because there is nothing impinging on the flow profile inside the pipe. The buttons are really just on the surface of the inside pipe wall. Uh, they are bi-directional, 
and we'll talk about uh, some of the measuring devices moving forward, the flow measuring devices as uh, being bi-directional or not bi-directional. Of course, bi-directional has uh, its benefits. Uh, good for a wide, wide range of Reynolds numbers, uh, installation piping requirements, uh, five straight diameters upstream and two downstream. So in terms of uh, devices that we're looking at here, this is one of the uh, lower uh, front end piping requirements. They have a linear output. Uh, we've touched on most of that already here. So uh, magmeters are good. They're very useful for the applications that they're in. All right, let's look uh, at the components of a magmeter, which may or may not have been, uh, I probably would have put this first, but it's here now. So let's look at what makes up a magmeter in terms of uh, its construction. Okay, so here's a typical mag meter cutaway. We have some excitation coils out here on the outside of the liner. Here's the liner that we're talking about. A flow tube, again, made out of some type of non-magnetic. Non-magnetic is different than non-conductive. Non-magnetic is what we're talking about here. Liner, maybe Teflon, whatever it is. And you can see here's a picture of the electrodes and not very easy to tell, but they just barely, barely break through the surface here. So that's why we say that these have a very, very low pressure drop uh, because there's nothing in there to cause uh, a differential pressure. So flow tube, again, must be non-magnetic. The liner has many options, uh, polyurethane, polychloroproline rubber, pro vinyl, blah, 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 uh, fiberglass, neoprene, ceramic, all kinds of different uh, applications. We don't get into it that deeply. Uh, you just need to know that you have to pick your liner based on the properties of the medium that you plan on pumping through it, uh, whether it's corrosive or has uh, wear properties, slurries, that type of thing. Um, we don't get it into the depth of uh, you having to tell me which one is which. Uh, also electrodes, uh, different types of electrodes are available and they're chosen again, specific to their application. Uh, for general purpose, water, wastewater, fibers, paper and pulp, or we use stainless steel electrodes or titanium electrodes. And then depending on the applications here, bases, acids, uh, other things can have uh, unique and very expensive um, metals and alloys in there as well for electrodes. Okay, electrode coating. Uh, we talked about that a little bit earlier. This is probably the main issue uh, associated with magmeters and probably the only thing that can really go wrong besides electronic failure. Um, so let's look at the solutions that are outlined in the ILM here. So how do we keep the credit from building up on those electrodes? Well, the most effective way is to keep a high velocity flow, right? A, uh, what does it say? A rolling stone gathers no moss. So a high flow rate will uh, help prevent things from collecting on those electrodes. Uh, we can select a particular electrode style. So here we have uh, a flat electrode and a conical head electrode. So looking at these, you know, you can probably deduce that this one would be more likely to collect crud if there was crud in there. This one would be less likely. Uh, we mentioned uh, built-in heaters that we can use to burn the crud off of these electrodes. Uh, we can also use ultrasonic waves. Uh, to, to vibrate the crud off of there, just like they clean the jewelry at the jewelry store. Okay, skipping around a little bit, this, uh, this uh, objective is a little bit choppy here. Uh, excitation coils is another part of the construction of the magnetor here. They generate the magnetic field uh, using the excitation current. And then we have the transmitter and flow tube. So the primary device is the flow tube, and the secondary device is the transmitter. They can be unified and mounted in, in place like we have here, or you can have the flow tube mounted in the piping and you can move the transmitter to the wall, or I don't know why you would do this exact thing here and clamp it on, I'm not sure, but it can be directly mounted or it can be re remotely mounted. Installation requirements. So things we have to be aware of, location in the piping system, and again, preferably vertical, but we'll talk about that uh, ex extensively as we move forward, all of these devices, because they all 
are going to tell you to mount it vertically if you can. Uh, we'll talk about upstream and downstream requirements. We already did actually five upstream and two downstream. Uh, grounding, very, 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 very important with mag meters and wiring in general. So let's look at uh, some of these points for a little bit more detail. Okay, location. Again, important because the tube must always be full or there will be errors. So here, definitely not really acceptable. You can easily have a half full pipe or water dripping down here and that's not good. Uh, this one here says unacceptable. You might go, oh, why is that unacceptable? Well, this is that five pipe diameter issue that we have right here. So we have plenty on the downstream side, uh, but we don't have enough on the upstream side. If this was the other way, it probably would be okay. Again, as the ILM say consistently through all the different measuring devices that we look at, mounting it vertically is best because there's no way that you can pump water uphill and not have this pipe full, right? Makes sense. Um, and then the last one here, good. This is probably the most, this is probably the most common one uh, that you're, that you're going to see because re the reality of it is, is even, even this one here, um, once, once you make this corner, the pipe's going to be full. All you have to do is make sure that you have a drop and some kind of a rise that has to be filled. So uh, this one is good compared to this one because this has got the proper five upstream diameters and two downstream diameters. Pipe must always be full or there will be errors. And one of the calibration things that you do is an empty pipe calculation, and we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, piping requirements. We talked about this too many times already. Uh, as with most devices, there is a required amount of straight pipe upstream and downstream that ensures accurate measurement. And the reason we have this is so that we can ensure a uniform pattern in the velocity profile. And this is, I think, the first time we've mentioned the velocity profile. And here's a quick picture of what a velocity profile looks like as something flows through a pipe. Uh, the stuff in the, in the middle moves faster than the stuff on the sides because the stuff on the sides uh, is fighting the friction of the pipe walls, and we end up with kind of a bullet shape, or I don't know, different people will draw this in a different way, um, but generally what you get is kind of a bullet shaped uh, flow profile, and this is what we're, this is what we're looking for, um, ideally, is it nice and uniform. Um, this one here shows profile after a piping elbow, so that uh, this screws up the pipe, uh, the flow profile a little bit, and this is why we have these upstream and downstream requirements. I told you earlier that this used to be way worse uh, when we talked about upstream and downstream requirements, and this is why it was way worse, because everything you do to the piping system has an effect on it. So, for example, if you've got at the upstream side of this, you've got a 90 degree elbow, well, you've got to have five pipe diameters. If you've got a control valve, it's got to be 10 pipe diameters. If you've got a control valve and an elbow, you know, all different kinds of things. Um, I'm not going to tell you I don't test you on this stuff, but I, I think you can make some pretty basic generalizations as you look at these piping diameters. And this is kind of generic for all the devices that we're going to look at. It's always going to be higher on the uh, upstream side and lower on the downstream side. And the more complicated it is, the more diameters that you're gonna have on the upstream side. And I can't really get any more detailed than that because it does vary rather significantly depending on the devices. Okay, grounding. Again, I said this is probably the biggest thing uh, when we're talking about magnetic flow meters because the amount of uh, interference noise can be equal to or even greater than the measurement signal. So grounding is what we do to eliminate that. Um, important. Uh, bonding and uh, important bonding and ground strap is essential. So you look, I'll show you a picture here, a few pictures here coming up. Um, dealing with this grounding and grounding depends on the piping system material. So whether it's a conductive pipe, like we would normally expect all steel pipe, uh, non-conductive pipes, which are common in the water and uh, wastewater industry, there's often lots of fiberglass piping. Uh, and then there's a specific application mentioned in the ILM where we have cathodic protection uh, piping systems. So we'll look briefly um, a slide on each of these. Okay, so for conductive pipe, we install them 
uh, with the inlet and outlet flanges are connected along with the flow tube to an earth ground. So again here, the piping system is all steel. Uh, there is continuity amongst all of this stuff here. So they need to be all tied together in order to uh, get that common zero or that uh, zero reference to ground that's shared throughout the plant. So in a steel piping system, uh, and you may have seen this in the field somewhere, like why are there wires going to the flanges and stuff like that? And that's to make sure that we're all connected here. Sometimes what happens, depending on the gasket material, if it's a car lock gasket or a, a spiral wound gasket, uh, the continuity might not be fantastic. You're kind of relying on the bolts and that kind of thing. So the, the flanges are usually tapped for a connection there. Uh, Non-conductive pipe or a fiberglass pipe here, the conductive fluid, not the pipe, is connected to ground using something called grounding rings, which are essentially uh, a full port orifice plate that gets mounted in there uh, along with the gaskets. So again, this creates uh, the, the connection between the process fluid, the body of the magmeter, and all the electronics and earth ground. And lastly, uh, cathodic protection piping. Um, not something that we typically speak about uh, in our trade here, but those of you who are electricians would have covered cathodic protection uh, in your electrical course here. And essentially this is sacrificing an anode in order to minimize the corrosion of the cathode, in this case, the piping. Uh, this requires the instrument to be isolated from the earth ground. So you'll see here, uh, similar to the previous example of a non-conductive pipe, minus the connection uh, to earth. Okay, wiring. Uh, most mag meters are four wire devices and you talked about uh, two wire devices and four wire devices in electronics and a major distinction between them generally is four wire devices are powered by uh, AC voltage, usually 120 volts or something like that. Uh, smaller ones are generally two wire and powered by four to 20 milliamps. Most mag meters because they have excitation coils, uh, require more energy and are four wire devices. As with most devices, we're gonna to wanna to keep the exposed ends as short as possible as they are subject to noise interference. So again, short bare wire coming out of our uh, cable, uh, tie back our uh, drain, no shield in the field if you remember that one and then make sure that we get them all. This is a, a symbol for the shield within a cable. So all four of these wires are in a cable. So this is a four conductor, uh, four conductor cable. Uh, and this is a shield that affects all of them. And again, you can see tied to a common ground, a coil circuit also tied to a common ground. So that's not really anything new for us. Okay, last but not least here, or getting close to the end here, not quite last, um, insertion, insertion style magnetic flow meters. I've never seen one personally, um, but they do exist apparently here. Uh, and this is a type of meter that has everything contained in a single probe, and they claim that it can be moved around easily. Um, you're not going to move this one too easily without an isolation valve, uh, but I guess that's the benefit and they exist. Bidirectional flow. We mentioned earlier that mag meters are bidirectional and that can be uh, a major, major benefit, right? If you're doing a custody transfer, or you're on a, a battery or you got big, huge tanks, uh, you can measure the flow into the tank with the mag meter. You can also measure the flow out of the tank with the mag meter. So one device, uh, two applications. When they flow in the opposite direction, the signal uh, is reflected as being 180 degrees out of phase with the field. Uh, and again, that type of application is a, a tank inventory application where you uh, fill the tank and you get the same in phase peak to peak here. And when you're draining the tank, you get the opposite signal. So benefit of magmeter, basically bidirectional. Next is something called empty pipe detection. We told you before uh, that having the pipe empty is bad, especially when the unit's powered on. Uh, when you do a shutdown and you're in a facility that has mag meters, uh, you want to shut the electricity off to the mag meters as soon as you can. 
um, meaning that if you're about to shut down and turn things off, you're no longer concerned about measurement, turn them off before you start draining out the piping system so that you don't burn out the coils. Um, some of them have this empty pipe detection, uh, which is used to detect uh, the lack of flow or an empty pipe as it would um, imply in the name. Uh, and this is achieved by using uh, empty pipe detection electrodes. So this electrode here will compare against uh, the re uh, reference electrode at the bottom of the pipe. And if they get the same electrical signal, then they can assume that the pipe is full. And if they differentiate, then it can assume that the, the pipe is empty. Um, so you need to uh, be aware that, again, you want a full pipe at, at all, any given time. Last objective, I think, here is maintenance and calibration. Not a lot you can do uh, with a mag meter. Um, maintenance is limited, but includes activities related to electrode coating, so basically cleaning the electrodes manually or otherwise. Uh, inspection for liner wear and making sure you have the proper material. Uh, coating of the flow tube, so again, you get buildups in the flow tube itself. Um, you want to, you know, give them a clean out. Uh, wastewater, for example, and uh, one of the things that's inherent with wastewater, and I know we all think about the, uh, the, the, the poop, I guess, is what we normally think about, but one of the grosser things in wastewater that you have to deal with is something called fog, uh, which is fat, oil, and grease, or all those things that make it down the drain uh, or down the toilet that aren't supposed to go down there. Uh, that collect on the on the pipe walls. So whether it's your deep fryer oil or your greasy hands or whatever it happens to be, that grease is, believe it or not, a little bit more gross than the poop itself. And it really does uh, it really does coat things. So that's kind of problematic. And last but not least, uh, grounding corrosion. So making sure that all your connections are good and and clean so that you don't get any drifting signals okay calibration a couple of ways to do it uh calibrator uh, process calibrator so you simulate the voltage of a sensor uh, and see if the transmitter reads accordingly uh, we can do it the old standard way with a proving device so comparing it uh, to some other uh, standard and then third uh, the verification software or we call this something uh, what do we call this in electron and analyzers? It was electronic something. I forgot the term. Sorry about that. Um, but basically, uh, smart devices, which are most devices nowadays, will compare internal measurements against historical measurements to determine whether or not the electronic components uh, have worn out or if there have been any changes. So it'll run through a startup procedure um, where it'll measure these values. It'll compare... Uh, compare values against previous values, determine the deviation, compare that against the deviation criteria, and then say pass or fail. And if it's all pass, great, life is great. And if it's fail, then it'll uh, guide you to do some type of a process. Wrapping up here, making the final curve, heading down the back stretch, advantages and limitations of mag meters. Meter is obstructionless. That's a huge one. Uh, doesn't collect that much stuff. Um, very low pressure drop, so that means that pumping costs are reduced. That's great. Uh, no moving parts, so anytime that happens, maintenance is always lower. Low power requirements, that's arguable, um, but not the be all end all of the world. Uh, meters are good for most acids, bases, waters, and aqueous solutions. And we've talked about aqueous solutions, meaning anything that's basically dissolved in water. Uh, they are widely used for slurries, uh, as they are obstructionless. None of that stuff gets caught on them. Same as in the wastewater plant. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that come uh, through the wastewater system, such as uh, you know pregnancy protection devices and feminine hygiene products. And if there was an impingement like some other measurement devices that we're going to look at, they'll collect on there. And that's pretty gross. Uh, I've been involved in cleanup procedures where there's T-shirts and underwear, and it's not pretty. So, uh, you know, 
having that uh, obstruction list thing is pretty beneficial. Uh, they have a good abrasion and erosion resistance, uh, provided that you, of course, uh, select the proper liner for your application. The meters are capable of handling very high and very low flows due to the, again, wide variety of sizes. We said uh, a few millimeters to a few meters and meters are bi-directional. So lots of bonuses uh, with mag meters. Disadvantages, again, work only on conductive fluids or fluids with a minimum conductivity, uh, five um, millisieverts or microsieverts, millisieverts, I think microsieverts is what it was. Uh, they can be extremely heavy, of course, because they're, they're really uh, solid. Uh, electrical installation care, obviously very essential. I hope I haven't uh, I hope I've stressed that enough. Price can be prohibitive, um, so you got to make sure that it's worth the money. Block valves need to be installed before and after so that you can uh, do your calibration checks. So one of the checks you have to do is a zero flow uh, and an empty pipe detection, so you have to be able to isolate it. So that involves piping. That's I don't know why that's a disadvantage. I think any measuring device is going to have to have that anyway, so I don't know why they specifically call that a disadvantage. Um, and although rare, the magnetic field may change the flow pattern. Um, and this is kind of a big stretch, but we talked about uh, paramagnetism uh, in a previous uh, subject here and how oxygen can affect the magnetic field. So I guess this is possibly what they're talking about here uh, when we identify that disadvantage. So that is basically uh, magnetic flow meters, uh, the ILM in a nutshell. Uh, the next slide here is a YouTube uh, video. And as you know, this is always fun trying to get this up on the screen. So let's have a look, see uh, how our luck is today getting this video uh, to play here. So let's try to get the video up here. And it's, this is an actually a, it's actually an excellent video. Pause, share screen, hit that screen, share, maximize, and hopefully by now I've got this figured out and you guys are looking at a video and here we go. Diverse substances are transported and distributed in piping systems every single day. They may include drinking water, <laughs> fruit juices, chemicals, or even slurries containing stones. The fluids flowing through pipes often have completely different properties. Consequently, there are different principles for their measurement. One method is flow measurement based on the electromagnetic principle. The basic physics of this principle can be traced back to the English physicist Michael Faraday, who in 1831 discovered that electrical current can be generated with a magnetic field. Roughly 100 years later, the Swiss inventor and priest Father Bonaventura Tillemann applied this knowledge to electrically conductive liquids flowing in pipes and built the world's first electromagnetic flow meter. Let's take a closer look at how this measurement method works. Two field coils are located inside each electromagnetic flow meter. With the help of what are termed pole shoots, these coils generate a constant magnetic field over the entire cross section of the measuring tube. Two electrodes which can pick up electrical voltages are installed at a right angle in the wall of the tube. The lining fitted on the inside wall prevents electrical short circuits between the conductive liquid and the metallic tube. If there is no liquid flow, no induced electrical voltage is measured at first between the two electrodes. The electrically charged particles of the conductive liquid are evenly distributed, shown here in water with red and blue particles. However, as soon as the liquid starts to flow in the measuring tube, 
the magnetic field applies a force to the charged particles. As a result, the positively and negatively charged particles in the liquid are separated and collect on the opposite sides of the tube wall. Now an electrical voltage forms, which is detected and measured by the two electrodes. This voltage is directly proportional to the flow velocity in the pipeline. Together with the known tube cross-section, the flow volume can then be calculated. The greater the flow velocity, and thus the separation of the charged particles, the greater the electrical voltage between the electrodes. The electrodes also detect what is called interference voltage, which has to be separated from the actual measuring signal. One method that has been successfully used for this purpose is to create a magnetic field with a pulse direct current. To do so, the polarity of the magnetic field is alternately reversed, illustrated here in slow motion. The voltage picked up on the measuring electrodes now constantly changes in polarity. As a result, all constant interference voltages can be eliminated. For example, electrochemical effects in the liquid or external electromagnetic fields. Thus, the size of such interference voltages has no impact whatsoever on the actual measuring signal. The advantages of this are a stable measurement and a stable system zero point. With an installed base of over one million electromagnetic flow meters, Endless and Hauser has stood for flow expertise and superb product quality for over 30 years. In other words, high accuracy, easy installation, and absolute reliability. For all applications, we have. All right. Uh, thank you, Endress and Hauser. And you'll see lots of Endress and Hauser videos. Uh, in this section because they, uh, they make a pretty good video. So that is all uh, that is left for this lecture today. I hope uh, I hope you liked that video. I thought it was a great video. Uh, kind of wrapped everything up in a, in a very handy dandy way. So that is it for today's lecture. We'll see you uh, again tomorrow.